Um, so hi everyone. So as you can probably see, my um, topic that I'll be talking about today is the effects of SSRI antidepressants on sexual function. I'm not sure how many of you know what SSRIs are. So um, what I'm going to do basically, um, first of all, I'm going to just introduce to you what the, these are in a bit more detail, give you a little short history on them. And then I'll go through what I investigated in my SSC. So my SSC involved me to look at different pieces of research and basically come to some conclusions from what I saw. So the four themes I'll go through in more detail later on. Then I'll go into what these results tell us, I'll give you a sort of summary on that. And then I'll sort of have a quick discussion on the future applications of these results. So what are SSRIs? So they're a large family of antidepressants, one of the largest families. Um, and by far they're the most common types of antidepressants that are given to people. So some of these I'm not sure if you'll be familiar with, but Prozac is quite a, a well-known one, um, being an antidepressant given to quite a lot of people. Sertanopram as well is probably the most common one given out in the UK. Um, this isn't for you to learn, obviously. This is if any of these are familiar. This gives you more of an idea of, of what type of drugs these are. So they've been in production since the 1980s, and since then their use has absolutely rocketed um, for many reasons. Um, first of all, the drug that was used before, which is called TCAs, they were the most common ones. Um, and SSRIs were quite good because they had equal effectiveness. They were as good at sort of curing the symptoms of depression. Um, but overall, didn't have as many side effects, especially the more dangerous ones like heart problems, which we're seeing quite a lot in TCAs. And lowered risk of overdose, which is quite significant. If people are suffering from depression, there's always the chance that they may um, try to commit suicide, and usually by overdosing on antidepressants, it's quite a common way to do so. So here I've got a graph of basically the prescriptions that have been given out of these drugs since 1998. And 1998, this is already when they were quite popular. And you can see, especially on here, this is Citalopram, and this is the overall prescriptions that have been done up to 2011, and it's continued to rocket up, to the point where, in some parts of the country, um, an eighth of the population are on antidepressants. So this is quite a significant problem if people are getting sexual dysfunction. So one thing that's important to remember is for a doctor, obviously, your most important thing is to make sure that your patients are happy. And so it's important to appreciate that for a lot of people, their sexual life and stuff like that is incredibly important. So here by Stinson, um, she, she mentioned that it would be erroneous for prof professionals to assume that a decrease or loss of sexual functioning is an acceptable trade-off for improved mental health. This is an incredibly important thing to think about from that perspective. Especially when if someone did suffer from sexual dysfunction as a result of this treatment, it can have massive impacts on their personal relationships, their self-esteem, sexual confidence and well-being, and how they see themselves. Um, so it, it has a much bigger social consequence than just the physical problem itself. Um, this, this is kind of shown by Cohn's study, which was uh, a fairly early study, um, who found that in his, in his case, 25% of the people who did start taking this medication ended up actually stopping because of the problems they experienced with um, sexual, or sexual problems. So the results of my study, um, I'm just going to start off with old versus new research analysis. This is comparing the early SSRI uh, research for sexual dysfunction with the later ones because they're very different. Um, I'll go into types of experience sexual dysfunction, so more into which particular problems are experienced. And then the two slightly more, um, I, what I find uh, very interesting parts, is the persistence of side effects uh, after cessation of treatment and um, how side effects can actually be ended up in the treatment in a new uh, part of medicine. So old versus new research. Uh, the older research for SSRIs, which was done more or less from the 80s to the sort of mid-90s, was very unspecific, looking for side effects and comparing them mainly with TCAs, which were the other antidepressants. Um, they were looking for uh, patients to basically come open about the problems they're experiencing, for example, saying what the problems they were having with, uh, for example, loss of libido, things like that. And often, as a result, these things could be missed. So I've got here a table, and hopefully it's not too complicated, but in an essence, it's SSRI drugs, and this is the prevalence of problems that they're experiencing compared to TCAs. Um, so what this, uh, this is a meta-analysis, and what it basically showed is that for a lot of the more serious things, um, for example, dizziness and lightheadedness, which can affect quality of life quite a lot, it found that SSRIs actually are far less than TCAs in, in how common they come up. Um, but we can see here that sexual dysfunction is slightly more common but only at 7.4%, which is fairly low. And if we compare this uh, to newer research, which was more systematic, and would ask 
uh, very precise questions about, for example, um, have you experienced any loss of libido, any problems with your libido, or have you any, any problems with your arousal? Um, they basically found very different results. So this is a table now of a, one of the first studies which really focused on the systematic inquiry. Um, and this is uh, Frozek, for example, and compared to the 7.5% that something we found earlier, we found 54% uh, of people coming with some sort of sexual dysfunction. And these were all SSRIs and they all seemed, saw similar sorts of ranges. And other studies up to modern day have found that anywhere between 30% and about 75% of people experience these problems, so far higher than they originally thought. So the types of um, problems experienced, I mentioned a, bit, a few earlier, but the main ones are difficulty reaching orgasm, um, dif decreased libido, and decreased physical arousal. Um, but it, there have been uh, cases where almost every single part of the sexual cycle have been experienced. Um, these are just the most common. So persistence of side effects, this is um, very new research has been finding suggestions that for some people, in an unknown sort of percentage of people, they're finding that after stopping treatment they're still experiencing these persistent side effects where they're unable to have or do one of the things I mentioned earlier. Um, so this is quite a problem for medicine obviously because we've been prescribing these drugs for um, over 30 years and now we're suddenly finding that for some people, these have long, lifelong, can have lifelong effects on their quality of life. Um, it also raises legal issues that doctors are potentially prescribing these drugs, unaware of what damage they can do to people. Side effects as treatment. So this, this is uh, just one slightly different um, view on, on the whole situation of sexual dysfunction as a result of this treatment. And this looks at um, basically the common side effects that are experienced and how if you look at them from another perspective, they can actually be used as a treatment. So the particular one in this example, there are many, but the particular example in the one I'm going to mention is difficulty reaching orgasm, which um, some people basically thought, oh, I'll do some tests on how that can affect uh, premature ejaculation. So they've done many studies over the last 15 years, and they're all quite consistently showing that giving this SSRI medication to people who are experiencing sexual problems with premature ejaculation are actually seeing massively improved um, quality of life as a result of their sex life improving. So they found delayed uh, time to orgasm and that's having beneficial effects on their uh, self-esteem and their relationships. And not just that, but these effects are persisting after they stop the treatment. So despite the fact that SSRIs aren't actually licensed for this sort of treatment, it is being uh, prescribed more and more often because, it, because of the positive effects it has on the patients. So I'm just going to summarise now uh, on the sort of things that I've talked about. So older research has not given us a fair representation on the scale of SSRI side effects. And there is the potential that SSRIs would not have swollen to the amount they're prescribed now had these things been known uh, more, more previously. Uh, it also raises questions between systematic questionnaires and spontaneous reporting because as I mentioned earlier we've seen far far more cases of sexual dysfunction being picked up on with this different inquiry um, and it, it raises the question of this is the research method of spontaneous reporting is that a good way to gather data. Um, so we've seen that it can have positive long-lasting effects on sexual health for some people especially those suffering with premature ejaculation also those with hypersexuality, um, and that we've, we've seen ongoing uh, convincing evidence that that's a, that's a potential solution. Um, but as I said earlier, for most people, the side effects of SSRI treatment, for many for people with depression, or sometimes OCD, can potentially have really negative effects on their quality of life, and they can actually persist far longer um, than the length of treatment. So further applications, so what can we learn from these results? So post-SSRI sexual dysfunction needs a lot more research. From my SSC, which was the, the assignment I wrote, um, we, I basically found that there was a very, very limited amount of data uh, that I could use to get a kind of good, good conclusion. Um, so it's very important for all, all things I've talked about today that the much more large-scale research has to be gone into, especially with the amount of people in the country who are taking these sort of drugs. Mental health is a lot more complicated um, 
then we would have originally probably thought prescribing this medication. It has a lot more links, I think, to other uh, parts of the body, um, but obviously we're still not completely sure on how, how this works. Uh, which raises the ethical question as well, obviously, of is it better to prioritise good mental health or good sexual health, or, or where does this line um, get crossed? And lastly, the importance of doctors um, being completely aware of these side effects that can happen and constantly being on top of this and then being, making sure that patients are aware of this as well. Not just for the fact that um, this, can, this is legally the, probably the right thing to do, but also for the sake of the patient, their quality of life is absolutely paramount. So thank you very much. If you've got any questions, do ask. Yeah, um, so yeah, it was, it was very interesting. Um, looking at, you know you mentioned uh, perhaps potential side effects of the SSRIs. Did you look at perhaps uh, a possible relationship between the mental state of a person and their, and their sexual function? Perhaps given that SSRIs are used to sort of remedy a mental state in the first place, could, it, could you necessarily question that perhaps the sexual function was based more on the mental state of the person? and the outcomes of their sexual function based on the results of how effective the SSRIs were in the first place. So all of the studies I've looked at during my SSC, I made sure it was important that all of the patients before had normal sexual function, before, be, um, before starting treatment. Um, yeah, that's quite an important thing to take into account. A lot of people who suffer depression do obviously suffer from sexual problems as it is. They were excluded from the study. So in this case, yeah, I, I, couldn't, I obviously didn't mention that. into a question which was I, I was absolutely amazed at that graph at the start mm. which was an aside for you I know but, but just showing the well that's really an aside the massive increase in prescribing yeah. of antidepressants um, but I also wondered as you went further on you said that sometimes they're now useful for premature ejaculation so can you tell from that graph if those, if those prescriptions are actually for depression, um, or are they just, in, are they just in a massive majority, in a massive, massive majority of people, it's for depression. It Premature ejaculation is, is a very small in comparison mm -hmm. amount of prescriptions that are given out, and it probably almost would have not been noticeable in the graph at really all. Impact, yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Any more questions from anybody? Yeah, just one more. Oh, there is one over here. Uh, was it only one type of one for type of uh, depression you looked at, or did you sorry, look at the effects of depression from the military as a comeback of uh, a war zone? So what post traumatic stress? PTSD. That sort of thing. Yeah, um, majority of the things I looked at was from severe depression, which wasn't caused from. PTSD, no. Um, but that's because in my study there were limited studies as it is, um, especially with regards to sexual dysfunction, so I, I, there weren't particularly many studies on that at all. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Indeed.